Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Guess what day it is? Squatter day. That's what I like to call it anyway. It's Saturday, it's leg day. This has been my leg day probably for the entire time I've power lifted, which is I think like eight years now. So today I decided to show you guys some of the rehab movements that I've been doing since I had knee surgery. But I wanna start by giving you a little backstory for how I hurt my knee. I hurt my knee in August of 2019, and for some reason, despite several posts on Instagram and talking to people and Facebook, I still get asked how I hurt myself. And no, it was not from lifting. So I'm gonna talk about that real quick just to tell you guys how it happened, and then I'm not talking about it again. So if you didn't find it from Facebook or Instagram or now my YouTube channel, then I'm sorry for you. I'm not talking about it again. So let's back up and talk about last year. The worst part about all of this is that last year was the best year of my lifting career. So I finished the year doing two meets in August, which is absolutely insane. Do as I say, not as I do. I don't want to ever have to do that again, but it ended up working out for me and I'm very proud of the accomplishments that I had. I ended up doing a raw meet in the beginning of August, I'm sorry, a classic raw, which is knee wraps. I did a classic raw meet in August, and I did that meet competing at 155 in a 165 pound weight class. And then three weeks later, I flew out to California, cut to 147 pounds, I think is what I weighed in at, for a raw meet, which is just knee sleeves in the 148 pound weight class. Getting ready for both of those meets was hard for me because I was having back issues. And now knowing what I know about my knee, the issues that I have with my back could have stemmed from there, but there are also some other underlying issues that I'll tell you about that could have contributed to my knee. Who knows, if something's hurting, it can move up and down and affect different parts of your body. So one could have been a trigger for another. I don't know which one started it, but to hell with all of them. In seventh grade, sixth or seventh grade, I started playing volleyball and I was having back issues and I got diagnosed with scoliosis. My spine is, was curved at the top and lower part. So I went to a chiropractor and he worked on me for, oh God, I guess it was for like six months or something, but he worked on me. We ended up getting it, you know, straightened out or whatever. So didn't have many issues after that. Um, Fast forward to starting to lift. I remember being told that I complained about knee issues, but I don't really remember having knee issues. I just remember my back was always an issue. I got hurt again in 2014, I believe. I was a high bar squatter and my best squat was 315 pounds. I competed in the lower 140s and I would have issues where when I would come up from my squat, the bar would roll up in my neck and my hips would shoot out. So it ended up looking more like a good morning and putting a lot of strain on my lower back. After um, going to a chiropractor and getting x-rays done, he explained to me that my left ilium, which is in your hip, was rotated inwards more than the right one. So that he felt was a big contribution of why my back was hurting and I would have inflammation in my SI joint. So we treated both. I got better. I kept training. Um, fast forward to last year, I competed at the Tribute. It was an invitational meet and I weighed in it, like I said, at 155. I competed in knee wraps. I still had back issues, which is why I switched to sumo deadlifting in the first place. I love conventional, it will always be my first love, but I wasn't gonna quit powerlifting because I couldn't do it. So I switched to sumo. I am not the best at sumo because I have tight hips. So my feet aren't really wide. I'm more of like a frog stance, close stance deadlifter when I pull sumo. But I found a way to make it work for me and I ended up deadlifting. Ultimately my last meet, I deadlifted 500 pounds in sumo and I also did that conventional so I was really proud of that. At the tribute meet I had a great meet. I ended up tying my best total or maybe like beating it by a pound but because I weighed in less I had the best Wilkes coefficient that I've ever had. A Wilkes coefficient is basically where they measure um, 
they do a calculation of your, if you're a male or a female, and then your body weight to what your best total is. Now, don't even ask me how you figure out what a Wilkes coefficient is. It's this big formula where they have like parentheses on this side and then multiplication on this side. And you got to remember PEMDAS and order of operations. It's too hard. Just Google the shit. That's how you figure it out. But my best Wilkes coefficient um, in wraps was at the tribute. So I was happy that I ended up you know, being able to accomplish that goal. Now, the tricky part was to come back and squat raw at a lower body weight three weeks later and expect to tie or beat my best total raw. I knew it was a gamble, but I'm hard headed and I'm stubborn. So I just felt like whatever, that's what I want to do. So I'm going to do it. The way I figured out I would train both so that my squat wouldn't take a big hit um, I was working with Trevor Jaffe, hope I'm saying your name right at the time, because I didn't want to stress about numbers. I just wanted somebody to tell me what to do and let me go on autopilot. I didn't want to call the numbers. I didn't want to think about them during the week. Like I get sick when I squat, like I'm nervous and I just, I knew I would overthink it. So I was really happy working with him because it took the pressure off of me to make sure I wasn't programming for myself and overtraining or not pushing myself hard enough because I was worried about getting hurt. It was funny because he gave me like a percentage to base my numbers off of every week. And I would be like, yo, just tell me what to do. What number do you want me to hit? And that's what I'm going to do. So we worked really well together and he did express concern about my goal for going from rats to raw because he said, you know, it might tank your squat to be overloading for so long and then try to go raw. But again, that was just the best way in my mind. I felt I could do it and I didn't want to do two meets back to back in the same division. So I figured out the best way for me to train both and hopefully my squat wouldn't take a hit was to do my warm ups for my wraps in my sleeves, but at a higher weight. So normally if I'm competing in wraps, I will work up to my best wrap squat is 485. I would work up to about 365 um, in my sleeves and then put my wraps on for the next two warmups before I got to my top set. Well, what I did this time was I would work up to 400 or around 400 raw. So I was training my raw squat and my wrap squat at the same time. It worked out well. I went out to California for Boss of Bosses. I made weight. I got an IV, which I do every single meet. I don't care how much I have to cut. I do it because the process of prepping for a meet is really strenuous. And anytime you can lower your body weight to help your Wilkes, most meets, when they're figuring out best lifter, they do it by your Wilkes. So if you can give yourself a better advantage by cutting a few pounds, that's great. And that's what I choose to do. My walk around body weight, depending on what day of the week it is, because Monday I'm heavier than Friday because I'm usually trying to de-bloat from having fun, eating whatever, Saturdays after squats. But my walk around weight is usually anywhere from 157 to 159, something like that. 159 is on the high end. But I always get an IV just to make sure my body is at its best, at its prime optimal state to put it through hell the next day. So after getting my IV, eat, you know, do all the normal things lifters do, we just rest. And then Boss of Bosses, day of the meet came. And it was a big meet for me because it was redemption. The year before I had gone out there to compete and I had the worst meet of my life, like literally the worst. I went four for nine. In eight years, I have never gone four for nine, which means out of nine attempts, I only got four of them. I got one squat, one bench, and then two deadlifts. And that last deadlift, literally, I gave it everything I had, and it set me back probably four months because I was dealing with my back. So going into this meet, I was really nervous because I wanted to do well. And it was more of, am I going to be able to handle the pressure of not thinking about, okay, this is where you screwed up last year. Get your head out of your ass. Can you do better this year? So I'm always nervous on squats. It doesn't matter if I'm in the gym. It doesn't matter if I'm at my house or at a meet. I shake. 
I feel like I want to throw up. Until I get my opener, that's how I feel. Then after that, I'm like, come on, baby girl, let's go. So got my opener done, got my second attempt done, and I was really thankful. I had been training with Malik Durstein for the tribute and for this meet, and he was there to call my numbers. I don't like calling my numbers. I do it in the gym because I have to, but once I'm at a meet, I don't want to know because even though I have an idea of what it is, just let me have fun. Let me go work. Don't let me stress like, why is it this number? Or, oh crap, I just did that. I don't know. That felt heavy. I don't know if I have what's more, you know, anything left in me. Just put it on the bar and I'm going to take it for a ride. It's either going to be good or it's going to be bad, but I'm going to give it my all. So he did really well with calling my numbers and I finished with a 424 pound squat, which was the best squat I ever had raw. And then my back felt okay, but that's always where I had issues. I would squat and if I lost tightness in the bottom at all, it's like, it felt like something in my back just kind of shifted and I would have sharp pain. So I was happy to get through squats. My bench was trash. I was wrapping him after I had my squats. So my forearms and my hands were shot for bench, but it is what it is. I knew better, but I wanted to help him because he helped me. Deadlifts came and this meet, I was like, okay, I let, you know, the tribute came. I did 496. I really wanted 500, but the goal of having a higher coefficient was more important to me than actually hitting a number. Lifters, you need to learn that. It's not always about the number. It's about adding to your total, you know, the number for an individual lift, especially if you're in a position where you can win a meet. Think about the big picture and not just that one lift. So at the tribute, we did 496. I had a little more left in the tank, but we met the goal. Boss of bosses, I was like, I do not give a shit how this ends. I want 500 pounds on the bar no matter what. Unless my second looks like trash, then don't embarrass me. So got through bench, get to deadlifts. I don't even remember. I, I always open really light because I want to make sure I don't bomb out. So we probably opened at like 460. Then I think I went maybe 474, 485, something like that. And then last attempt ended up being 501. I felt so good and so confident. And I was just like, this is it, baby girl. One more lift, everything on the platform. You have fought so much shit to get back here. Let's just right here. This is it. Do it. And I lock it out. I pulled it sumo. My best friend Jessica was there, Jessica Pippen, and she was, I'm gonna put the video in cause she, the ending, you don't even see where I hurt myself cause she was too busy jumping and hollering, which I love. But I have another clip that I saw from someone's Facebook where I lock it out, I put the bar down, and then I'm just kind of like, oh my God, we finally did it, I'm so excited. And I'm like, yes, and I jump and I stomp, which I have never done. Now I'm a jumper, I always jumped. But stomping, no. And so I literally jumped and I stomped. The first two times, it was good, but I'm extra. So I couldn't stop there. So I decided to jump one more time, like hammer this in. And that third one felt like somebody hit me in the kneecap with a baseball bat. And like, I was so out of it. I thought that I had hit knees or whatever with the guy who was back spotting me. And so you see, I kind of turn and look and there's nobody by me. And I'm like, oh shit, I think I hurt myself. All right. And then I go to take a step and it hurts and another step and it hurts more. And by the time I get to the end of the platform, I can't walk. And so Jessica's like, yes, yes. And she grabs me and I'm like, don't pick me up. Don't be careful. I hurt my knee. So she puts me down. We go in the back, instant swelling. There's no discoloration or anything. Poor lady who, who tried to come check on me. She was like, okay, well, can you, can you do this? And I was like, can you just give me some ice? And she was like, okay, sure, somebody get her some ice. Okay, can you do this? Can you move like this? And I was like, ma'am, I just need some ice. I don't know what she said to me after that. She was still trying to get me to do stuff and I really just was not hearing it. And I was like, look, I just want some ice. I'm sorry, ma'am. She left me alone. Somebody brought me some ice. <laughs> Like I just, it didn't matter because Malik was also competing and I was worried about him. And so I was like, we can deal with the knee later. We still have work to do. I wrapped the knee wrap around it and I walked around the rest of the meet like that. Um, after the meet, there was still some swelling, but I could still move my quad. 
So I was like, it's just not a big deal. Maybe I hyperextended it, you know, I don't know. Walk through the airport, knee still swollen, but whatever, fly back home, I'm good. A week later, I'm like, oh, I guess I need to go to the doctor. I go to the doctor, he says I need to get an MRI. I get the MRI done and I go back to the doctor the next week and he's like, tell me again how you hurt yourself. So I told him, showed him the video and he was like, I have a page of diagnosis of what you did to your knee and that is absolutely ridiculous that it just happened from stomping. So I look at the MRI results and it's literally like, this is strained and this is ruptured and this is torn and just all this crap. And I'm like, all right, so what does that mean? And he said, oh, you just need to take some time off. What, how much time off? And he's like, uh, just take it easy. I'm a power lifter. I don't know what that means. So I'm gonna need you to be specific. I don't know that I'm gonna listen to you, but I need you to be specific and tell me what you're saying. And he's like, you'll be fine. You don't need surgery. You just need to take some time off. So I'm all excited. I come back and I'm like, yeah, no surgery. I posted about it on my Instagram. I'm good. I'm a, you know, relax and take some time off ice, a little bit of rehab. I'll be good. But it's strange to me that this same doctor who said I don't need surgery said to me, why don't you go ahead and get a second opinion from another doctor in this facility um, and just to make sure. I've never heard of a doctor telling you to go get a second opinion from another doctor in their practice. But all right, whatever, I'll do what you say. The next week I go in and I talk to the second doctor and I bring the results to him and he is freaking out. Like, why are you walking around without crutches? Why don't you have a brace on? Your knee could like give out at any minute. This is a serious injury that you have and you need surgery ASAP. Man, what? Like, that's not what the guy just told me. How? Why? You know, I don't even believe you either. That's some, that's, that's shit. That's bullshit. So I need another opinion. I don't trust either one of y'all. So I go to another doctor and this doctor 100% agrees with the second doctor. Get on crutches, get in a brace. You need surgery. So I decided to have surgery with the third doctor because the other two doctors pissed me off and I wasn't giving them my money. And... I had surgery on September 25th, September 25th. Um, my quad tendon was ruptured. So this tendon right here above my knee had just busted. So he went in, that's this initial scar here, cut here. And then there were two ports that he cut on the side to go through. And he also wanted to look at my ACL. The MRI results showed that my ACL had also been ruptured. Now, I didn't know. I mean, I just knew my knee hurt. But when, we went in, when I went in for the consult, he said, now, were you having issues with your knee before? And I explained to him that I wasn't or I didn't think I was. But he was like, you don't have an ACL. And it's not a new injury because there's no fluid in that area. So do you remember when you tore your ACL? No, boo, I don't. The only time I remember hurting my knee is high school going up, cause whatever, I'm 5'3", five, 5'4", five, but I thought I could block. So I went up to jump and joust a ball with a girl and we came down and we hit knees. That's the only time I remember hit, hurting my knee. And I was on crutches for a couple weeks, maybe, but I didn't have surgery, I didn't get it checked. So I have no idea. Now I've played volleyball like that played in sand volleyball like that. I have done freaking foam 3K and Tough Mudder and played golf. Like I love golf, like twisting my knee like that. How? With no ACL. Never bothered me. If he hadn't had a picture to show me, I would have swore that dude was just trying to get some more of my money because I didn't believe him. And initially I wasn't going to do a second surgery, but with the quad tendon surgery, he went in, looked at the ACL, and he was like, you really need to do this now. If you don't do it now, you're risking potential injury in the future because you don't have one. Do you want to have another surgery later down the line? He knew how to get me. So I said, I'll do the surgery, but he wanted me to do it six months after my quad tendon surgery. Now, a tendon takes three months to heal, I learned. So I was like, dude, I'm giving you three months. And then I want back on the table because I'm not going to start healing and start getting back under the bar and feeling good. And then you're going to take me out 
six months later for another surgery and I'm going to start from square one. So get them both done ASAP and then I'll go from there. So I had two knee surgeries, one September 25th, the other one December 26th, the day after Christmas, um, to fix my quad tendon first and then to go back in and fix my ACL, which I now have two screws in my knee. I don't know if it would have been better to wait, but right now the worst part about it for me is that my quad muscle has lost, as you can see, a lot of size and a lot of strength. So rehabbing my ACL has been really hard because I should have my quad muscle to use to rehab my ACL and I don't. So I'm kind of still working both, but mainly just focusing on getting my quad muscle back. So my rehab consists of a lot of isolation movements for my quad and I've been struggling to find stuff that works because my right leg will be sore, the left leg won't. I think I have found a few exercises which I'm going to insert into this video today. This is my progress right now. I haven't started working out yet, so there's no leg pump, no nothing like that. This is what my legs look like without having any kind of work done. And you can see the definition a little bit starting to come back. I'm excited about that, but you can just see the difference in the two legs. So shout out to my Shiro, Susan Salazar. It was crazy to watch her back in January of last year blow out her quad tendon and then she came back at the end of the year and had an amazing meet. I don't think I'll be, I know I won't be back this year, but the goal is next year, not sure when, kind of have an idea, but I'll let you guys sit on that for a little while. But goal is springtime sometime next year and I'm just going to bring you guys with me on this journey back getting under the bar. So let's get into the workout.